Hey guys, Ted here. Welcome to Teddy Games. Today we're going to be creating an awesome Gang Beast inspired game. Basically ragdoll physics and stuff like that. So we're going to use physics to create a game. It's going to be very, very awesome. First thing is first, I've actually created a Patreon for this channel. So if you like videos with these kind of icons, then please consider supporting that because those are going to fund more of them and hopefully we can get more than one video a week about a single game and stuff like that. Really makes my life easier. Anyway, let's get straight into it with an intro. <laughs> So let's take a look at our final product. For this I decided to go with a two player game so that you have a local multiplayer on a phone. Not something necessarily extremely common on apps but it does happen sometimes. You'll notice that there are two sides to the phone, two health bars to each side and then of course you just gotta swing around in circles. You only really have two controls which is rotate left or anti-clockwise and rotate right or clockwise. Try and hit the other player to cause damage. There are multiple weapons to choose from so that you guys can have different sort of battles and stuff when you're in the bus or on the way to school, or on the way to work. Very, very cool game. If you want to download, link for that should be in the description below. But for now, we're going to talk about how we actually made the game. So a lot of the assets I create are actually created in Hexels 2. Hexels 2 is an incredibly useful platform to create pixel art and hexagonal art, and, and, and oh, that's basically it. They have a few other features, but I don't actually use them that often. So I went into this inspired to create a game that was sort of medieval-ish, because I kind of like making medieval assets. And the way I usually come up with ideas is to make the assets first, put them into Unity, see what I can do with them. For this one, I just made a sword, I put it into Unity, and I was like, well, what if you could just use your finger to swipe a sword around and kind of fight somebody else? That was rendition one, it wasn't really that great. So I decided to make the arms, and I decided to make the actual character, then of course made a very, very basic background, layered it using the new tile map system. Believe me, the new tile map system in Unity is so cool for 2D games. It's going to change a lot of things, and it makes it a lot easier to render backgrounds and stuff like that, so you can create your own cool little backgrounds. It should be very cool, but in a future video, I'm probably going to use it a lot more for now I'm just making a very simple ground layer which is going to be one color one sprite. Right now really cool we have all the assets but we need to attach them to each other so that we can get some kind of movement. I went ahead placing the arms of the body to where I wanted it I also placed the sword to where I wanted it and then of course I'm going to start adding hinges to each rigid body. So I created some colliders and all these types of things on every single object added a rigid body to each removed the gravity from each because we do not want this while we're testing. Then of course we add something called hinges. Remember we're working in rigid body 2d so we want 2d colliders and of course 2d rigid bodies and finally 2d hinges hinges are really cool you get to pivot around a single point from two different types of rigid bodies so for this for example i took the arms and i took the point where they're actually attached and put the pivot point there of course repeated this process making sure that the connected body on each hinge was actually relative to the parent or whatever they're connected to so the arms would be connected to the body the sword would be connected to the arms great now we have a full playable character what else do we need well now we need some method for actually controlling our character. First thing, I started by getting the input touch of everything. For this, it's going to be a little bit different because we're going to have more than four fingers on the actual device. Usually, we only have one finger on the screen or maybe two, but for now, we're actually going to have four fingers on the screen trying to battle it out on either side. Now, because there are a few phones out there that don't actually support more than five touches, we cannot have more than four controls. So we are going to split the screen into quarters. We are going to have top left, top right, bottom left, bottom right. And of course, one player is going to get each side, limiting me to only rotation. So that's basically all I can have. So it just panned out that that was going to be the only method of actually controlling these characters was basically input touch count. But basically the thing I use here is something called rigidbody.addTorque. Torque is basically a rotational force, which means it adds force in a specific rotation. When applying the force, we use a float positive numbers, of course, represent clockwise and negative numbers represent anti-clockwise. Or it could be the other way around, I'm not sure. Of course, now we have everything we need. Once we get these touch values in every single corner of the screen, I'm going to pop it up right there if you guys want to copy that one out, but it's very, very simple. I used a for statement this time instead of an if statement. Basically, we want multiple touches because we don't want it when player one is turning left, player two can't turn anywhere. It's very, very simple reasoning, but it does actually work out very well. So now we have our character and we actually have our character rotating. The hinges that are applied to the rigid body of the main character actually work in a line and drag the sword around. And I figured, hey, floppy sword, you know, good name. And it just worked out really nicely and it was just a fluke because afterwards I added all this talk thing. I didn't think everything would work as well as it did, but it ended up working. But there are still a few things to do. For example, we created this blood effect. I basically made some pixel art for some blood and ported that straight back into Unity so that we have some nice Unity blood effects. And of course, created a material, made sure to make it multiply so that it darkens with the background and doesn't get lighter, which is what I would think Puddles of Blood actually do inside a game. Then of course under emissions, make sure that the burst is set to something really 
ridiculous, like 30 or something like that. So you have 30 of these particles being instantiated every time you get hit. So I have two types. I have a blood particle system and a death particle system. They're both basically the exact same thing, except the death particle system instantiates a little bit more to cover up the fact that we've just made our character disappear. As I said before, particles are actually an incredible way to make game objects actually disappear completely, replaced by a particle system. Great, so now we have our particles, but we got to detect these collisions, guys. I made another script I call it sword and made sure that every time it collided with something that wasn't its master then it's going to instantiate some blood <laughs> got him Those sand flies but where exactly do we instantiate this blood well we can instantiate it on the actual game object but it looks a bit finicky i prefer to instantiate it upon the collision point so whenever you create the function on enter collision 2d you actually want to state what the collider is going to be named as so in the brackets next to it we put collision 2d space give it a name i call mine obj as a lot of other developers do now of course we want to instantiate the blood at the contact point and the way that we can get this is obj or the collision 2d dot contacts and of course we set it to zero which is the point of collision. Contacts are the points of collision, although it is saved as an array because you can have more than one collision point, which means that we're not instantiating it everywhere, we're just instantiating it in the first place that we actually hit our player. Or else we are going to be spawning a whole bunch of stuff. And of course, once you get that contact, go dot point, which is the exact pinpoint in a vector two that you actually got the collision. It's a very, very handy technique and you'll definitely have fun with that one. Finally, in order to cause the damage, I've actually made a multiplier for the amount of speed that you are going or traveling at or the amount of rotational energy you're putting out in the sword basically the faster you're going the more damage you do and the basic way that i do this is to use this rigid body 2d dot velocity dot magnitude this basically returns a float which is a really useful float because we can multiply it by our base damage that we're giving the weapon and of course every single weapon needs a master to make sure that it's not actually colliding with itself and we can do a check for this inside on collision enter wonderful we've got a weapon sorted our player actually moves which is really good and that's basically the entire gameplay it's not that hard great now comes multiplayer Un Fortunately, it is not as easy as just copying and pasting a script and then sort of having two separate scripts there working individually. No. Tata does things in an even lazier way where he doesn't even need to duplicate the script. We just need to add the same script onto two game objects and of course judge whether or not they are player one or player two. The way I did this was to create a manager function, of course, add a spawn component. Then of course you have two different spawn points. Player one, of course, is the first instantiation and player two is the second instantiation. And you state that in the actual scripts after instantiation of these actual game objects. Confused, so was I. Let's slow it down a little bit. So under the manager function, once one game object is instantiated, you actually save that game object then later on we can actually grab that game object and then change a script on it the character script that i created for these characters is actually able to be changed based on one variable on these character scripts that i've actually created i have a player number and then of course within the script i have different reactions to screen taps for each character. They both run the exact same scripts, but they're controlled in different ways. So you can see now why I don't actually want to copy and paste a script when it's as easy as changing an int. So of course the int can either be one or two. If it is one, then it's only going to be controlled by the bottom of the screen. If it is two, it's going to be controlled by the top of the screen. But of course we invert those controls so that both players have the exact same control or else the guy on the top is going to have inverted controls and nobody likes inverted controls, let's face it. Now the way you change it is to actually save the game object on the manager script after instantiation then go in and change that value on the script of the character so if it's player one we change it to one if it's player two we change it to two and of course if we fail to do this it's just going to stay as zero therefore we know that there is an error well now we have our manager script it does spawn stuff in but we want to add a little bit more control so let's get straight into ui ui very very awesome i created my own buttons and hexels of course because i want to keep this kind of pixelated effect mixed with a little bit of hexagonal artwork so in hexels i created a basic box i rounded the edges very very simply i then ended up going to make sure that it's on a point or no filter we really want that instead of bilinear or it starts to blur as you get bigger when of course we're creating ui we create a new ui panel canvas system once that canvas is up there we can create our first button which is basically going to be a spawn button because we don't have different characters just yet then of course we are going to go into the sprite editor and decrease the borders to the point where something can be repeated whatever is inside that green square can be stretched and stuff like that but you got to make sure that you don't have anything that you don't want to be stretched next of all we want to create our button and replace the sprite under image with an actual sprite that we have created then of course down in image type you want to change that to slice this is 
is the key to being able to resize your button to any size and make it look right. It will look perfectly to scale, which is really, really cool, and it saves you having to do like a big button and saving more image than you really need. Excellent, but I basically copied this exact same method for the actual health script. Now, how do we actually get health? Well, I've talked about it before, there are thousands of tutorials, but basically our character script also holds something called health. Every time we get hit, we actually run a damage script, which minuses that health. So the health bar is actually judged by a percentage, not an actual number, but you need to put it from an actual number to a percentage to an actual number again, so that we can actually get the width of that health bar. So the way to do this is to actually get the width of your screen. And then of course you want to times that width of your screen by your current health divided by your maximum health. This is an incredibly useful equation, basically turning it into a percentage of the actual screen number. As your health goes down and as it's reacting to this, it's going to be boop, 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 and eventually get to zero and then of course you die. Now we basically have our entire game. We press battle, our characters spawn, la di da di da We have health bars. If they kill each other, then of course the health bars disappear. Our character disappears, it spawns a particle and then boom. And we're nearly there. An overlooked thing is actually sound in certain games. And of course for this one, I made a few little sounds. Usually when you get hit, you're hearing me going, ugh, ugh. Ugh. Yeah, I'm no Adam Harrington, but it works. Finally, just went in FL Studio, played around with a little bit of percussion so that you can get the th 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 th. It's just a snare, basically, and a few, uh, that's it, it's just a snare. Like those things. That's basically it, guys. There's only one thing left to do, which is repeat the same processes that I have just told you how to do. Add more weapons, add a selection system using the same button system that we were using before. Then boom, boom, Bob's your uncle, Fanny Gerard, and John's your, your neighbor's wife's dog. Of course, thank you so much for watching, guys. That's the end of the video. Hopefully you guys learned something. And of course, if you guys are making your good projects and stuff like that, and you want some feedback, or you just want me to see what you're doing, message me on Discord. I always love reading your stuff. Unfortunately, it is becoming a mission, a incredible mission to reply to everything at the same time. It's just so many messages just flooding through. I can't even read them all. That's how hard it is to go through them. My solution to this was to create a private discord for patrons only, which means that we have, um, you guys can be on the main discord, of course, and get the supporter roles, or you guys can be on the private discord. And of course, I'm going to focus a lot more on that one. Uh, because the other discord is so many people you can ask them more questions it's not just me and i i can't i just can't spend time all on that 100 it, it's hard we have 3,000 people there 28,000 subscribers loads of the comments that i'm reading through and, and messages and even emails now i'm getting randomly and i don't know how you guys figured out my email address but you did and this isn't the one i told you guys this is the one i haven't told you guys so please don't email me thank you <laughs> see ya